Well, it's that time of year. It's time for yearly themes. Are you ready, Mike? Oh, I'm so ready. I've been ready for about three months. <laughs> You've been ready for about three months yeah. with your yearly theme? Mm-hmm. This has become, partly against my will, an annual cortex tradition. The discussion of the themes. How long have we been doing this, Mike? Well, the idea of themes for a year first kind of came up in 2016, and you were bouncing around the idea of what you were calling the year of less, which was just kind of like an idea that you had, a thought that you had going on around in your mind about reducing your commitments over the year. Right. And then in 2017, we decided that we would actually set it up as something we would do every year in January to eschew the idea of resolutions because they are trash. (laughs) <laughs> and to to put our stake in the ground for right. yearly themes. In 2017, we both had a year of less, mm-hmm. which I actually, oh, you know, I was thinking about this when I was preparing, and we could talk about the year of less a little bit more in a bit, but I think that is a really good starting theme for most mm-hmm. people looking to do this. You think that's a good starter theme? I do, because I think most of the times when people feel like they need to get some more order in their life, it's because they have too much stuff going on. Mm. So the mm-hmm. idea of taking a year to really think about the amount of projects you're taking on to maybe weigh up the projects that you're currently doing and try and weed out some of the stuff that's not necessary is probably a really good starting point for uh, adopting this type of idea in your life. It's the new year. People are thinking about how they want their life to change. And as a general statement, people are looking to add things. If, if you think of what people usually describe as New Year's resolutions, it's always additive to life. Life is going to be the same, except more. I need to do more of this thing. Right. I need to work harder to do to stop this thing or whatever, yes. right? Like I'm, I'm going to completely change my eating habits and I'm going, I'm going to cook myself a beautiful dinner every night. Like all this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. People are always thinking more. I'm going to go to the gym more. But the fundamental thing about life is it's limited and you only have so much and the removal of things is almost certainly the better place to start than the addition of things because the addition of things is a little bit of i am going to work harder by simply like knuckling down Mm -hmm. and making myself do a thing which is why new year's resolutions almost always fail so yeah i think i think you're right there that year year of less of simply trying to simplify a life is probably a pretty good starter theme. If someone's trying to survey the landscape and think, what do I want to have for a yearly theme? So like yearly themes themselves, they are guiding principles. They are ideas. They are not actions like a resolution Mm -hmm. might be. So the way that we described this in the past, I think of my yearly theme as like my North Star. Mm -hmm. It is the thing that I look to when I'm trying to make decisions. It's the thing that I look to when I feel overwhelmed and try and keep that as my focusing point for the year. Mm -hmm. Because for me, a yearly theme is born out of a sense of frustration with my current situation. Mm -hmm. So I have found something about myself that I want to change. I have found something about my work that I want to change. And I think, right, so next year, what I can do is focus on this. And so that becomes my yearly theme. Yeah, and and I think back when we first started talking about this, Low in 2016, when I wanted to do my year of less, the like the frustration with New Year's resolutions is twofold. They are pass fail targets on a very long time scale. <laughs> and so people are setting a New Year's resolution and they're saying, you know, this time next year, X is going to be the case. Mm-hmm. And I think it's terrible for a couple of reasons. The pass failness of the target it can be incredibly discouraging to people. And it's also just on too long of a time scale very often for people to really be able to hold it in their mind that, oh, if there's an action that they're supposed to do, well, does anybody really start that action on January 1st? Probably not. You think like, oh, I have time. I have a year. So I, I think it's, it's like, just like it's a poorly structured thing for actually implementing human behavior change. Mm-hmm. And so, I guess you you like the metaphor of a North Star. I tend to think of it more as as a background process of it's specifically not a target. It's not a goal that you're trying to achieve. 
It's something to keep in the back of your mind as you're going through the various decisions in your life. And, you know, will, will this help me towards whatever the year theme is? Will this help fulfill that theme? Or will this work against that theme? And so, again, with the year of less one for me, as a background process, the thing I kept thinking of with many decisions and with regards to a lot of work was, does this have to be done by me? Or is there a way that someone else can help me with this task? And like just keeping that in the back of your mind is a way to direct your actions slowly over time. And of course, like a theme itself, just the words mm -hmm. can be empty for some people, right? Because what are you trying to achieve? So I think we both do this. I definitely do this. I have some like ideal outcomes, some things that I want to focus on when it comes to looking mm -hmm. at my theme. But I'm very focused on not putting fail states to them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. So like these are a selection of things I would like to focus on that I would mm -hmm. love to happen as part of my year of stabilization, for example. Mm -hmm. But if I don't achieve them, I haven't failed. Yeah. And we both have done this before. You've done this even more so. Have a year theme. Ideas of that theme continue through multiple years because you feel like maybe you didn't do this part of it. You mm -hmm. twist it. You change it a little bit to allow you to continue focusing on it. But just yeah. because the year ticked over again and you didn't get to where you wanted to be doesn't mean you failed. It just means you have to keep your focus. The other thing about it is, and this is this, is this weird thing where we've ended up falling into this tradition that you like of talking about it every year around this time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's partly as a result of, of what we're trying to do is I feel like we're trying to change minds here. Yes, we need to get to the people, <laughs> to the Cortexans, at yeah. the time they are considering resolutions, yeah. considering another year, and say, no, don't do that. Come this way. Yes, this is like, you You are walking along a dangerous precipice. Perhaps, perhaps instead of going down that path, which is along this sharp edge, Come, come along, come stroll with us along this beautiful garden path. Look at these beautiful guide rails that we have along <laughs> yes. this path. Yeah, there's, there's no way to fail here. It's a much gentler slope. And we're talking about it now to try to change minds and to try to capture people before they make the terrible mistake of making a New Year's resolution. But the thing that is uh, always a little bit strange for me about talking about it on an annual basis is, is also the... I'm very against the idea of it has to last for a year or that it has mm -hmm. any particular set time at all. Mm -hmm. And so we just end up talking about it now. But, you know, I, I feel very strongly about the themes. They come into your life and they, they serve their usefulness and then they dissipate when they're no longer useful. And it's interesting to hear you say that you've been thinking about your theme. It's been in place for three months. And I'm very aware that like my theme has been very strongly in place since the summer. And now is finally the time when I can actually talk about it. Well, you know, I think that we have a history of that. I think we should talk about mm -hmm. some of our previous themes. So again, we can give people more ideas when they're coming to mm -hmm. this. But one of mine was the year of positivity, which lasted from June to June. Yes. Right? Yes. Because I was finding myself, because a, a big part of what I do is talking mm -hmm. about and focusing on technology, especially Apple. And the year, this was, I think this was 2016 to 2017, because at that time, a lot of the rhetoric around Apple products was very negative. Mm -hmm. And I was finding myself becoming increasingly frustrated with the idea of mm -hmm. talking negatively about the things that I enjoy because it was just making me sad. So I was trying to find more positivity in that stuff. And mm -hmm. that helped me enjoy the technology part of my life way more. But it lasted from June to June because that was just yeah. what I decided to do. But I had like the year of adulting, which was one that I did a couple of years ago, which encapsulated getting married, moving into a house. Well, after I got married, there was it was done. So, mm -hmm. But with that, typically for me, I will have a couple of themes for a year in those uh, situations. And over the last two years, I have had multiple themes for each year. Although, Gray, spoilers, I have one this year. Oh, one, okay. Well, one and a sub thing, but just... You'll see. You'll see. You'll see. Okay. You'll see. So it's already two. No, okay. it's not. Yeah. You'll see. I have. You, you'll okay. get it. Yeah. Again, they're they're flexible and they serve you as as they as they wish. And I also view this as under ideal circumstances, the theme sort of fades into the background because it 
becomes a natural part of your thinking. And so the, the year of less became very much that for me, that it just became a natural part of my thinking of, you know, is this work that it is critical that I do it or is, is it work that can be helped by somebody else? And then after that, I did the year of new, which the idea was I was just trying to do some expansion of my life into things that I was a little bit uncomfortable with. This included things like going to conferences or being more social or just trying different kinds of stuff. That was the year that I decided, oh, let me try to make a vlogging video mm -hmm. on my channel. Like that was part of the year of new. And that just, again, became a part of my thinking process of I'm still not like a crazy guy who does all kinds of wild stuff. But I do find that that just got incorporated into my thinking of on some of the cases in the margin, I'm a little bit more likely to try the different thing than I would have been in the past. Because yeah, I guess yearly themes, if followed, will either help establish or break habits. Yes. Yeah. And that sort of stuff can last for a long time. Oh, and also depending what you do. So like in our year of years of less that we did, we mm. both hired people. Well, that will continue, right? The work that those people will do to help give you more time to take away things that you don't want to focus on in the same way anymore. Well, that mm -hmm. is a lasting impact that that one year had or mm -hmm. two and a half years in your case, for the year <laughs> of less it kept going. But yeah, that is a thing that can will last longer than the year theme, which can be very valuable. Yeah. So again, I just think it, as Mike and I go through this episode and we talk about our, our previous year and we talk about what we've been up to and, and the upcoming year of themes, I just think it's it's important to keep in mind this loose structure. It's it's something to have in your mind. It's a background process or it's a guiding star, but you are not setting a target. You're not setting a goal that you can fail at. It's This is much more gentle guidance in a broader area of your life. Be kind to yourself. Yeah, be kind to yourself. And I was thinking about it this morning, you know, knowing that we were going to record today. And I, I realized that this this happens to take advantage, I think, of a process of, a, of the human mind, which is to like your brain is always involved in sort of telling yourself a story about your own life. And there are many cases in which that can lead you astray. But I think this this is one of the areas where you can use that as a as a tool to your advantage. And I know that in, in the past years, we've discussed how by having a theme, you sort of view your life through this lens and the open-endedness of it allows many things to be incorporated under the banner that were not necessarily originally the idea that you had started out with, but that doesn't matter. And so, you know, things like year of new or year of positivity or year of, of less or year of order or year of health or whatever it is you want to choose. It is a good thing that your brain can start telling yourself a story about how lots of things in your life are related to this positive directional change. So this again is why I think the fuzzy borders are a feature of this idea in the selection of a theme and don't get too wrapped up in the details about it. It's just a, a broad umbrella over your mind to sort of guide it. So shall we review our 2019 themes? I know we said that year themes cannot have a fail state, but... <laughs> no, don't undo the work we just did. Uh, no, no, I'm not, uh, I'm not undoing it. I just, I think it's, I, I want to bring it up because it's an interesting case, right? So not the previous year, but the year before this one, I had picked the year of order as my yearly theme. And basically, after a year of new, I felt like I needed a bit more order in my life. Mm -hmm. I felt like I wanted to try to give myself a schedule. And I was like, okay, we're going to have order in life. And I just, it just so happened that I picked a terrible year in terms of a number of personal and professional things that occurred, where it's like, I had a year that there was no order that was going to be done. Yeah. So that, that year, in some sense, could be regarded as a epic fail. But on the other hand... I still think of that as a time where having that on my mind allowed a lot of damage mitigation. 
So I was able to keep my life more ordered when I was traveling, and there are a number of times where I think I kept things together much better than I otherwise would have had that not been the year theme. But so all of that is to say that last year then, when I was picking my theme, I decided to do the year of order again, which I was calling the year of reorder. This is one of the rare cases where I felt like I hadn't really thought about the year theme enough. Like I actually wanted to extend it for a longer period of time. And it also was it was a case of the, the reason I picked the name reorder is because I, I was thinking about how it was a real transition time in my life that I think I hadn't quite realized of. I've been a self-employed person for a really long time. And part of the reason that the year of order didn't work out the way that I wanted to was I, I felt like, oh, I am trying to impose on myself the ideals and wishes of a previous version of Grey whose concerns and interests I don't really care about. That I need to sort of think about what are the goals that I want for myself given the situation that I am in now and to sort of not really be carrying over stuff from from the previous idea of like this gray wants a very rigid schedule to which he sticks to the work all the time and that's that's like what he should be aiming for so i'm happy to report that the year of reorder has been a great success i'm Yay! very pleased with the way that it's gone <laughs> hooray this is good news yeah so uh spoiler my theme for next year is not going to be the year of re-reorder. <laughs> I'm actually pretty pleased about that, honestly. I'm looking for Were something new. Were you worried new. that was a possibility? It's like, <laughs> I don't know, year of reordering or like year of reorder two or order mm -hmm. more. I don't know. But so I, like, I'm, I'm just, I'm very pleased with the way that it went. There are a number of, of areas in my life where I feel like I had specific targets for what I'll call chaos reduction. So you... You can't control all the areas of chaos in your life, but I did spend a bunch of time looking around and trying to think, you know, what are what are some of the things that are chaotic over which I do have control and how can I work to minimize those things? And so that was really good to do. I feel like having that as a background process in my mind really helped on some of those marginal decisions about like, okay, how can I, how can I work on this area to work on on that project? One of the areas that I feel like was the biggest tremendous success was, it's not exactly a schedule, but I did want order in my life in terms of regular exercise. And this was something I was trying to achieve. And I am pleased like I have never been in my life with my current exercise habits as they came to be in the year of reorder. Now, you and I have discussed, Mike, we are not huge fans of exercise. It's the worst. It is the worst. My opinions on exercise have not changed. It is still the worst. And I still do not like exercising. And I still feel disgruntled at the people who describe how they're so invigorated after exercise. When really the only thing I want to do is take a shower and have a nap because I'm just exhausted. I can't remember when I first came across it, but like if you're trying to think about exercise, you want to try to find something that works for you, like something that you actually like. You know, so I've done things like tried running and realized, no, I hate it. This is not for me. I've tried, you know, tried various things. I'm so pleased you didn't like running. <laughs> that would have just really upset me. I know that you were worried. You were worried during yeah, that time. Frank Gray comes a runner. I just, it's just because it's so, I can't do it. And like, right. it would have annoyed me because we were so in sync about like hating exercise and not being good at yeah. it. And then you go and become like, oh, I'm a great runner now. And it's like, oh, you've betrayed me. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand that feeling. I get it, Mike. Okay. But, but we were so on the same page that that project was doomed to failure right from the start. Okay. I, just, I just had to go through it to <laughs> know that this was, this was not going to work for me. And so, but so one of the things that I eventually found, which I always want to minimize it when I say it, but is, is weightlifting. It does not mean like raw, like Hulk level weightlifting, mm -hmm. but just, you know, moving things that weigh more than books. And this, this just really worked for me. But I've had just a hard time in the past few years being regular with that schedule. And so going into the summer, 
for this year. I was like, okay, it's year of reorder time. Let's let's think about this. What are the problems with exercise? Why is it that you routinely, talking to myself here, why is it that you routinely do a weightlifting routine for a while and then it stops and you don't do it for a while? Like, what are the actual causes of this? And so I was trying to identify things. And, okay, so the problem again here is the traditional idea is to think like, well, I'm just going to try harder. I'm going to really mean it. I'm going to buckle down and like try really hard to exercise a lot. And I just fundamentally do not believe in this as a solution to human problems. The just do it philosophy, like that's great for people who are naturally productive, but it's not great for the rest of us. For the rest of us, you have to try to like arrange your environment to make it easier. You got to trick yourself. You have to trick yourself. So I did a couple of things. And the first one I will talk about, it strikes me as so dumb, I can't believe it. So, Mike, where I live, there are two gyms within walking distance of where I am. Now, the one gym that I've been a member of for years is, I am going to say, 200% nicer than the other one. It's a much nicer gym. But you know what it also is? Four minutes farther walk than the other gym. Mm. And that walk is also ever so slightly uphill. And I've been thinking for years, I should try to join that other gym. And then I've thought to myself, no, don't do that. That's dumb. It's basically the same distance. Don't don't do this. That's just a total waste. Plus, it's a worse gym. Plus, it's a worse gym. But you know what? I I finally bit the bullet. I was like, forget it. I'm going to cancel the other gym membership. I'm going to get the one that's closer. That's four minutes closer and is not uphill. And I cannot tell you how much of a difference this single change has made. (laughs) In in just the reduction of friction. uh, And it's like, you feel like a moron when you trick yourself in these ways and it works. There's there's some part of you which is like, I am a human being. Right. I, I have a brain. I have a functioning precortex, right? Like the smartest animal on the planet. But also walking up a slight hill is enough that I'm just not going to do perhaps one of the most important things that I can do, which is to try to stay healthy. Yeah. 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 Right. Like it's it's totally ridiculous. But it, it was a thing where I looked around and thought, like, let me let me just try to solve this problem. And so this has made an enormous difference. And then. The other thing that I was trying to solve is a flexibility problem. Is this gym related to? (laughs) Yeah, so this is gym related to. Okay. Not like bending flexibility. Okay. okay. Right? Let's spend some time on the balance beam. No, I'm not spending any time Ah, on the balance beam. Okay, cool. Balance beam, maybe it works for you, Mike. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work for me. Oh, sorry. But so the the other main problem is most of like the weightlifting routines that you're going to find are relatively strict in the sense that there's particular equipment that you should be using, you should be doing sort of like the same exercises at very regular intervals and changing the weights a relatively precise amount. And they're great if you always have access to the exact equipment that you need. But this was my other big hindrance is, especially when traveling, you can't depend on having the equipment that you need. Oh, I mean, and plus, though, like, you know, no one wants to be the person at the gym who's, like, waiting on the other person to finish doing their thing, and you're just like, oh, I need that machine, but they're on it, and, like, do I have to ask them to come? It's just the worst. Yeah, exactly. And the the equipment that I would normally need is, is an Olympic bar, and most gyms will have one, maybe two of those. You know, no hotel gym will have an Olympic bar, so it already means, like, if I'm traveling, I need to go somewhere else. And this is this is why, like over the summer, any exercise routine that I might have built up while li- while living just my normal life was always destroyed over the summer. And you know, you'd have some little hotel gym, and I think I don't know, I don't know what to do. So I think I downloaded literally every single exercise oh, app on the app store. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> Fit No, but look, here's what I was trying to do. I was trying to solve a problem, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is okay. I was looking for like, what can I do in terms of exercise? And the like this, this again, this, I feel like you should be with me on Mike, because we are both people who do not like exercise. Correct. And so 
Like what I don't want to do is like, I don't want to become an exercise enthusiast. Mm. You know, like, <laughs> like I look at exercise the same way I look at brushing my teeth. This is a thing that needs to be done. It's better for me if I do it. If you told me I didn't have to anymore, I wouldn't. Yeah. If you give me a pill to take so I stop brushing my teeth every day, I'll just take yes. the pill. Like, exactly. Okay. I don't want to become like a toothpaste aficionado, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was trying to find a solution to this problem. And of all, like all of the exercise apps, I did find one. And I'm, I'm mentioning it here because I want to talk about the solution that it provides. So it's, it is an app, it's called FitBod, which I had been pushing on every single person that I know about like, you should try this exercise app. But here's, here's the key thing. And it's like, yes, this is what I was looking for. It is an exercise app that basically asks you in various ways, three questions. It's like, what exercise equipment do you have available right now? And th this scales from nothing to like a full gym with everything you could possibly imagine. The second question is, how much time do you have available? And, you know, what's your confidence in your exercise skills? So I could say, yeah. none, none, none <laughs> to this. You'd have to have some time available, right? You could say mm, five okay. minutes. None, some, none. Right. But based on this, it automatically generates a little exercise routine for you. And it's, it's weight based primarily. Like that's what it's focused on. It's not a cardio app. But the thing that also makes it incredible is it keeps track of what have you actually done and auto rotates through all of the various muscle groups to make sure that you're balancing out your exercise. And it's just like the flexibility of it is tremendous. And it solves exactly this problem that you were just saying. Like if you go to the gym, even when it spits out, okay, here's the five exercises that you should do. If you go to the gym and someone's on the machine of what it says you should do next, you can just press this little button, which is like, recommend me an alternative exercise. I don't want to wait for this guy. Mm. And it just gives you, it's like, okay, do this other thing. And when you're done, it has a record of like, how easy were each of these various exercises? You know, they, they have like machine learning magic, which then generates the recommendations for next time. But it just does an incredible job of solving this problem of I have inconsistent equipment or I don't always have equipment that's available whenever I want. I don't, I don't want to learn anything about exercise routines and what I should do. Just tell me what to do. I don't care at all about exercising. Just tell me what to do and I will do it. And so it's been a really great solution. I said last time on our state of the apps episode where we go through all the apps on all of our devices so that people can find recommendations you know, I'm not in the business of, of like app of the year awards in the way that you are with the upgradies. But if I had to give an app of the year award, I would give it to FitBod as by far and away the app that has had the, the largest positive influence on my life this year. It's just made exercise a million billion times easier by solving the exact problem that I'm looking for. That was like a very huge success for me on the, on the year of order. And I don't want to go too much farther on, on the recap, but I, I will say that while I wasn't trying to implement a schedule in my life, exercise really is a sort of foundational habit that has a lot of positive impacts on, on other areas. And I do feel that being able to have a regular exercise routine had a lot of positive impacts on my work. One of the things that I really thought about a lot is the old me was very interested in, in trying to maintain a schedule for here are the times that you should work and arranging things this way. And I think over the year of order, I, I really came to, to accept the, like the natural flow of creative production. I just don't have like a great metaphor for talking about it, but just thinking about that there's like, that it's a little bit like breathing, that you have inhalation, you hold the breath, and then like you exhale. And that this is, this is the way that information is processed. Like, okay, there's various phases where even if I'm not writing on a schedule, am I doing something like it's the summertime and I'm taking in a lot of information, right? I'm going to places that are related to videos. I'm doing something new that might turn into a video, right? This is the part of the process, which is taking in information. And 
it shouldn't be surprising that if I'm doing a lot of that, the amount of writing per day goes down. And that then when you have all of this information, there's a sort of processing and reviewing phase. And then there's the final phase of like the actual production of like, okay, things have been processed and sorted and thought through, and now it can actually be written out into a script. And each project has this sort of phase over time. And so I feel like I've really come to terms with this, especially now having done YouTube for a long time of trying to force the work into a particular schedule. I'm just going to like let this idea go and I'm going to work along with what current me views as the natural creative process. Mornings are high quality time and I will always protect them for high quality work. But what is the nature of that work in that time? Well, if I start to write and the writing isn't really working, I can move into instead taking in more information with reading something on a related project. And if that's not working, I can, as discussed last time, go on a focused little work walk, hold an idea in your head, think about it for 20 minutes, come back and then try again. And so this is my overall review for the year of reorder. And I, I just feel very happy and in a really good place after this year. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really pleased. Yeah, that's really good to hear. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad to, to be coming to you, not with another do over. Yeah. At the beginning of the year, I was really thinking about trying to figure out what are the needs and what is it that the current me wants to really focus on. And I just feel like keeping that in the background in my mind helped clarify a lot of things as the year went on. And so, yeah, I'm in a, I feel like I'm in a really good place. Now, how are you doing with your year theme, Mike? So I had two themes for 2019. They were kind of linked together, but there were some slight differences, so I wanted to split them in half. Stabilization and diversification. Mm -hmm. So stabilization, for me, I like, had a couple of different offshoots from it. Mm -hmm. One of the main ones was to take away, for 2019, my continued focus on growth for my company for Relay FM. Mm -hmm. Year over year, it'd be like growth, growth, growth. That was what I was fo focusing on. And it wasn't something that we necessarily meant to do, but mm -hmm. as the company started growing, it was like, well, we should keep focusing on the growth, right? That seems like a good idea. And it is a good idea. But I felt like we needed to take some time to focus on making some differences where it mattered and also stabilizing some of the core parts of our business. So this was putting more processes into place and refining stuff to make sure that as we continued to grow in the future, we were set in a good place. So that was kind of where I was coming from. And I feel like we, I did a great job with this this year. Like the stabilization thing, I feel very good about. So I was working with Kerry, my sales manager, and, and between the two of us, mostly her, put a lot of really good <laughs> processes in place for the year, right? Like I'm really happy with how that's all come together. And we're going to continue that work into 2020, but it did what I wanted it to do. Like I feel like we have a much better handle on our process from kind of like the perspective of making sure everything is in order. And I feel mm -hmm. like that has led to just a much easier year for the both mm -hmm. of us. What happened was what I kind of thought would happen. The, we did the company's revenue did grow, but not as much. Mm -hmm. And I'm totally happy with that. Like, that was best case scenario for me. I also, okay, one thing that I wanted to do in the year of stabilization was not to get distracted by big new things. Totally failed in the summer, but it was worth it. <laughs> so my summer was completely distracted uh, in part due to the fifth anniversary show that we did for Relay FM and also the podcast-a-thon. These were things that came up during the year and were like, we should do these, we want to do these, and it completely distracted my summer. And I wasn't focusing on the things that I would usually focus on over that period of time, but I was happy to have failed at that because mm -hmm. what we got out of those two events was worth it. So I wouldn't want to change that. But it was something that was not stable. They were two new huge things happening at the same time, which was challenging. Yeah. To give you credit, however, they were one-off events. Like they were mm. unique 
in like you're not going to have a fifth anniversary show every year. The fifth anniversary right? show for sure. We're not going right. to do that again next year. Right? Is the podcastathon maybe going to happen again next year? I wouldn't be in a position to talk about that, but right, right now, of course. But if we have always every year tried to raise money for St Jude, so right, we will want to do something again next year. I don't mm-hmm. know what it will be, but I wouldn't want to say right. we'll never do it again. Right. No commitments are being made. Not right at this now. Point in time. Yeah. So that was like the business side when it comes to stabilizing. And I feel like I, I did that. And so there was some mm-hmm. personal stuff, but I'll come back to that in a minute because I also have some business stuff around diversification. So the stabilization stuff was really, from a business perspective, focusing on my existing company. Mm-hmm. Diversification was around me, Mike Hurley, ensuring my own long term stability by looking at new business opportunities. Right. And this is where Cortex Brand came from. Now, we've spoken about Cortex Brand a bunch on this show. We're going to continue to. But Mm -hmm. the original path that we had in mind for the Cortex Brand company this time last year is very, very different to where we are now. Yes. Because one of the products that we were going to work on was a journal called The Theme System, which we're going to talk about later on. the, The success of The Theme System that we've had so far completely moved the focus of Cortex brand to the point where I I haven't really been able to focus on much else. Mm -hmm. We started out with making some new clothing merch that we wanted, right? And like the subtle line. It's like, oh, let's keep... And that went well, so we keep focusing. But I haven't been able to look at any of that stuff because the theme system has been needing to take all of my focus that I have to give to Cortex brand in Mm -hmm. in trying to stabilize now that because we are not stable with that yet. Um, Mm -hmm. but that is the thing that I want to keep working on. We want to keep working on to see if it can be a sustainable business, but I consider it a huge success for the year of diversification because I think it's the, the beginning of something really exciting. And that was way more like the way the theme system has succeeded is way more than I could have imagined the diversification beginning for Mm -hmm. 2019. So I was really happy with that. It's funny because the diversification stabilization almost sort of, they're like very different things where you can have a bunch of different projects that are not necessarily individually stable, but they're that that are helping with the diversification. And I feel like Cortex brand right now is, is at that point. Like Cortex brand is in the, in the growth stage, which doesn't make it a stable thing, mm-hmm. but yes, the existence of it is totally a, like a success on the diversification front, mm-hmm. especially for, for you as an individual Mike Hurley. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things where when you're self-employed, like you have to keep an eye on that kind of stuff. And and you just have to, you always have to be aware of this because the, the, like, the income situation for a self-employed individual is always more unstable than it's going to be for uh, someone who is an employee. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it is a good thing to, to think about. I have all my and, eggs in one basket. Yes. <laughs> and now I have another basket that's got an egg in it. One egg, not all of them, right? And so... But that basket is attached to the other basket. Mm-hmm. This is this metaphor is getting very complex at this point. No, no, it, but but it is it is a, it, you have two baskets, but you're also the only person who's carrying them at both at the same time. I guess yeah. Maybe. So like, if you stumble, it's still a real disaster. Uh-huh. Uh, so yeah, there's like toward looking towards the future. There may be ways in which you want to change that, but things have to start. I have separate baskets with different people separate carrying baskets, the baskets, different and there's people like varying eggs, more in those eggs. baskets. Yes, we'll get there. Look, 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 baskets and eggs. That's the that's the bottom <laughs> that's line. What it is. But there were personal things to both stabilization and diversification. So mm-hmm. uh, still keeping on the diversification line. Uh, using Instagram more and Twitter less, big tech. Mm-hmm. Like I have statistics that show that right in my screen time, screen crimes uh, information. It's all <laughs> right. It shows me. I can see it. I wanted to look for an office space outside of the home. I have been looking. Cannot find anything. <laughs> Please let me know when you want to build that building. Oh I'm man, yeah. at that. I didn't mention this as part of my own year of reorder, but yeah, I. One of the other things I identified was that my office space outside of the house was not working for me for a bunch of reasons that don't matter. I am in the same boat as you of like, okay, I know what I'm looking for. Let me just find that office and tumbleweeds no one will give blow it to me. across the desert. Yeah, it's it's shockingly hard to find usable office space outside of the home. So my, my sympathy is with you. What I have learned is if we want to start a shop, it's very easy. I can buy shops up and down this town. But, like, I can't rent an office space. It's wild. Um, I also, for stabilization, 
I wanted to approach my health. And I've mm-hmm. had some complex health related stuff this year, which is mm-hmm. nothing like too serious, but has not allowed me to focus on everything that I wanted to. Uh, right. Like I wanted to get fitter, but that has not right. been something that I've been able to achieve in the way that I wanted. But I've lost a bunch of weight. Uh, I've lost 22 pounds this year, which is 10 kilograms. <sighs> that is a lot to lose. And I, for maybe the first time in 10 years, feel good when I look in a mirror. Mm. And that is a massive thing for me. And it's changed a bunch of stuff for my life, which is actually mm. enabling my 2020 theme. Like there is a bunch of Ooh, stuff in my 2020 theme that I would not be able to focus on. Or I would not want to focus on if the health stuff wasn't better. So now I am a... a I'm at a point which I'm happy with to stabilize on. Like, so it's like mm-hmm. 85 kilograms is like my goal right now. Like, and I'm staying around that. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know how many pounds that is. Let me use Google. It's 187 pounds. I feel happy with that weight. Mm-hmm. I feel like I could lose a little more, and that might be something that I do next year, but I don't consider it as important anymore. No. Like, for me now, it's like in 2020, I want to exercise more. Right, that's just something I want to do anyway, like because I have to, because I wanted to do it in 2019. Oh, Mike, have you heard the good news about, about Fitbod? Fitbod? Yeah, I downloaded it while you were talking about it. I'll take a look. But, and I'm thinking now that like doing the exercise will will also like change some of my body weight stuff, and mm-hmm. and, and then I can reassess where I want to be. But right now, I feel I feel good. I'm feeling really good. And mm-hmm. you talking about like fitness, losing a bunch of weight will inherently make you feel better, which it does. Yeah, but I I know I need to do more around fitness in general. But I'm very happy with with st- finally stabilizing my weight, which had been mm. slowly getting more and more out of control over the last six or seven years. And now I feel like I understand what I need to do for my body to mm-hmm. keep in shape like that. And I was like, for years I've been so jealous of people. I look at them and be like, how do you stay at your weight? Mm-hmm. You've got to learn what your body does. And I've learned what my body does with food now. So I know how to kind of keep it in check. So. Do you want to share any of those details or do you want to keep that to yourself? Oh, for me. Okay. So what I did was, I mean, the way that I lost the weight was I cut carbs and sugar out of my life in a serious way. Like mm-hmm. didn't go crazy with it. I didn't follow the keto lifestyle mm-hmm. and I allowed myself cheat days and stuff like that because I didn't want to lose my sanity, which I would. And basically just by eating significantly less carbs and sugar, I lost the weight. And mm-hmm. at this point, I now just vary. So some days I'll be like really good. Some days I won't be so good. And then mm-hmm. I see kind of what a day can do to my weight. But then I also know how long I need to be better behaved with my eating to get rid of that weight that I lost because I ate a pizza. So now I'm I'm able to to fluctuate and feel good about that because I know how to maintain. But it took a lot of work over like 10 or 11 months mm. of like cutting the carbs, cutting the sugar, going through the withdrawal, which was really tough. Uh, <laughs> but you just got to go through it. Some people react to it worse than others. I reacted to it pretty badly. Um, yeah. And, and and now I'm at a place where like I I can vary it a lot more and it takes a lot of like you've got to think about your diet, you've got to think about what you're cooking and it's hard work, but I got there. Yeah, cutting any amount of carbohydrates is not something that your body wants to do the no. first time you try to do it. No, right? it was so surprising. Yeah, it, it is it is really a shocking experience. I think it makes quite apparent a sort of fight that you're having with your body of like your body wants this one thing and your brain wants this other thing. And you can really feel that the body has an edge on that fight at the start for sure. (laughs) And like talking about the weight stuff, I know that sounds incredibly New Year's resolution-y, but I had no goal. Yeah. I was just like, I'm going to try this. Mm -hmm. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It did work. But I Mm -hmm. didn't set myself something i had to achieve Mm -hmm. you know so and like for me as well it was just like stabilize your health and then that turned out being losing weight yeah yeah that's and that's why we've said you know as as a sample year theme for people several times like year of health is a totally reasonable theme Mm -hmm. and the, the lack of a specific target is part of that because you know maybe you want to start out with 
weight loss, but that's not really working for you. And so you just switch to exercise and you find, oh, exercise works better for me. And then maybe that helps you in other areas. Or, you know, like I said before, perhaps over time you realize like the focus is all wrong. It's like, oh, the year of health actually shouldn't be focused on physical health. It should be focused on mental health. Like this is the more foundational problem that I need to focus on. So yeah, it's, it's not target dependent, but that doesn't mean that you can't celebrate having stabilized your weight because that kind of human behavior change is is very difficult so you sh- you really should feel great about that because it is such a hard thing to do and you you do need to do like you've done a lot of experimenting and and figuring out and and trying to see how how this works for you in your exact situation and it's a world filled with contradictory information because everybody is also different so yeah it's just a it's a very hard place to implement long-term behavior change. So, you, But you should feel great about that. I'm very proud of myself. And you look pretty good, Mike. Thank you. I haven't been so proud of myself over something I've done in a while mm-hmm. because it felt like I got to a point where it was impossible because mm-hmm. I tried so many things and none of them were working. Mm-hmm. But then I just found the thing that worked for me. But it was really hard and I didn't want to do it a lot of the time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But I got there. <laughs> All right. Is it time? 2020 theme time? Okay. 2020 theme time. I want to know the name first. Don't just jump in there. All right. You got to tell a tale mm-hmm. with the year themes. Okay. We have fuzzy borders. One thing blends into another. So let's let's sit back and let's let's rewind and think about summertime gray. During the summers, I'm often in America. Covered in pockets. Yes, I do have pockets because I'm traveling uh-huh. and you want more things, uh-huh. obviously, like a reasonable person would. Yep, 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 yep. Hand sanitizer, aspirin, all sorts of things you want to keep in your pockets. That little camera you want to have on you all the time. L- little camera, uh, <laughs> earplugs from loud situations. Mm-hmm. Anyway, there's many things. So many things. Many pockets. <laughs> Th- things I won't tell Mike about on the podcast because it makes him nervous, but whatever. Like, there's just stuff. You carry stuff with you. What are you talking about? And don't worry. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Wait, what are you doing? Anyway. Now I'm more concerned, I think. So Gray's out on the road in very isolated areas, out in the desert. As can now be described, part of what I was up to, going to Indian reservations. Spending a lot of time alone, thinking about stuff. You know, sometimes sometimes you feel like I have picked a year theme. But sometimes... <laughs> The year theme picks you. And this, this is very much a year where the year theme picked me. So at one point in this summer, driving across I-80 West, across the Great Salt Lake Desert, and it just arrives. This is the year of clarity. <laughs> In a previous episode, the the phrase psychedelics was mentioned. And as you Uh describe, like, being in a desert somewhere and you finally get clarity. Were you foraging at all in those deserts or are you all good? No, no, no. I'm I'm all I'm all good. Here here's the problem, Mike. I like I am psychedelically curious, but actually a very boring and risk averse person. So Mm -hmm. no, there was there was no ayahuasca involved in this situation. Okay. But Spending long periods of time on your own, you end up just thinking about a bunch of stuff. Like your brain is processing over various things. And so, yeah, it's a bit of a, like, I am aware that this is perhaps one of the least actionable themes that I've had so far. It is much more just like a very strong feeling that I have about where am I currently And how do I want to focus my time and attention? I often use this phrase on the podcast and and just in like talking to people in real life that one of the projects of a human life is that you should be working to build a life that you want to live. And, you know, that's a very broad statement, but I think it's it's a good way to think about stuff. I feel like the year of clarity for me, which 100% started during this summer, and I, and I have been living since then, has a real mental clarity on the various projects in my life. Like, 
what are these projects for? What do I want to do? What do I not want to do? And how are the things that I'm working on improving my life? Or are, are they being like the platonic ideals of themselves? So this is a strange year theme for me because I, I feel like in the past we've announced the themes and talked about what's going on. Whereas now I feel like I'm very much in the middle of a thing. So this is both, here's what the theme is, but also what I've been up to. On a very small scale, one of the things I've done is like going through my OmniFocus and looking at all of the various projects that I have. And I've closed down a bunch of those projects where you just look at things and go, am I ever going to do this? It's like, no, this isn't going to happen. You just build up projects over time and you think, let me just get rid of this. I want my OmniFocus to be clear and purposeful. Like don't, don't build up a bunch of projects that you're never going to do. I know like I could have even just things like how many books am I actively reading? And so I look at my Kindle and I think, am I ever going to finish that book? Let's get real. I'm not going to finish that book. And so, you know, just remove from downloads, go away. And that is on the small scale, a kind of clarity. Am I reading this book? Or am I not reading this book? Let's make a decision about it. Don't let it linger around in this in-between world. Is this a project that I'm ever going to finish? Or is this not a project that I'm ever going to finish? Don't let it linger around in this in-between world. So that's just the very small scale of things. But it goes all the way up to the biggest scale things. And of all of the projects in my life, the biggest and the most important ones and the ones that, if anything has an impact that have the largest impact is making the YouTube videos. You know, this is the center of what I do and it reaches the widest audience of anything that I do. And so a huge change for me was, and th this sort of came out of the year of reorder and transitioned into this year of clarity is thinking about how do the videos work? What is the purpose of these? And how should this work going forward? A huge change that I made this year that was is 100% the direct result of Year of Clarity was changing the way that the business model for the videos work. So I switched to a method where my videos are now funded by Patreon and the Patreon switched from an individual thing to a monthly support project. And let me tell you, boy, was that a nervous day when I made that change. Yeah. This again is one of those moments as, as like an independent creator person, like that is a nerve wracking time. You never know how it's going to go. I felt like hugely relieved and hugely grateful that the, like the overwhelming response was just incredibly positive from the audience. And I think that happened because I, I was I was trying to think a lot about the interaction between the creator and the audience and how that changes over time. Another way to put this is, is like aligned incentives. So I was thinking a lot about the video production over the past few years and realizing that I had slowly started to work myself into a position where things were just unclear. I'd had a bunch of projects that were becoming bigger and over a longer scope in time. So this is things like the billet video, and this is things like the road trip video. Now, here's the thing. Advertisers want deadlines. And it's totally reasonable. If someone is going to advertise on your video, like there's an embedded sponsorship, they would like to know roughly when that's going to happen. Because they may have things they need to promote. There's spending budgets. They're trying to coordinate advertising across a bunch of different media or maybe different channels. Like, it's totally reasonable for advertisers to want to know, hey, if we give you money to mention our product, could you tell us like plus or minus 30 days when that's going to happen? And that is a thing that's totally reasonable for very many YouTube channels, but partly because of a like a change in focus on some of the things that I was working on that was becoming just increasingly untenable for me to be able to actually deliver on any kind of deadline. And it's also the thing that for some people, deadlines really work. They're really motivating. And knowing yourself is such an important skill that's harder than I think people think it is. But some people were great under deadlines. And I know that I do not. 
I find deadlines to be anti-productive. So I, what I was trying to do is have advertiser deadlines that were way far in the future with the idea that like, well, I can't possibly miss a deadline <laughs> that's six months from now, right? Mm. But it it totally had the reverse effect of, oh, I kind of want to work on every video in the world except that video. And it was just like, I hated it. It, it made me really unhappy. And particularly with the scope of some videos, it was just totally impossible to, to try to do. But it also fallen into this problem of since my Patreon was per video, I, and in retrospect, I just didn't catch this soon enough, but I, I'd been increasingly thinking about this concept of what is a real video. So it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to have this video be advertiser sponsored. I'll just have it be Patreon supported. But because I would manually press the button for, does this count as a real video? I found myself increasingly thinking about, well, is this a real video or is this not a real video? Your audience weren't thinking that. Only you were thinking that because everyone just wants a video. I don't care what it is. This again, I completely agree. And it's one of the things that was, I, I came to sort of realize over time and my own audience reaffirmed this when I made the change that this idea that I had gotten into my head about what counts as a real video the actual Patreon supporters, this distinction is not relevant. They're like, we would like you to make videos. If you deem it worthy of going on your main channel, people will happily support it with the Patreon. Yeah. And so this ended up becoming a thing that creatively was a problem. And so I'll give a good example. So oftentimes it's not even clear what a video is. And the canonical example of this is the Christopher Billup, the race around Staten Island video that I made, where that originally started out as, oh, this will just be a footnote to the Statue of Liberty video. And then it ballooned into uh, a ridiculous size project. In a, the best possible way, a monstrosity. Yeah, I think that's one of the better videos that I've made. Like, I'm really happy with the way that mm -hmm. came out. But the way it is, a year after I started it, I had no ability to know at the beginning, what is this going to be? And there are many times where I almost abandoned that project because it existed for long periods of time in this undefined area where it's like, what is this going to be? Why have I spent six months on this? I don't even know what this is. Is this a mystery that will have a great ending? Like, I have no idea what this thing is. Why am I even spending time on it? Now, of course, a year later when it's done, I think it's a pretty great video and I love it. So here's where the clarity comes in. I shouldn't be thinking about, is this a real video? I, as the creator on the channel, should be thinking about what is interesting to me to make. And that is a compass that I feel is relatively clear in my brain. And the whole reason that I stuck with the billup thing for a year is because the compass in my brain kept pointing back to this as like, this thing is interesting. Human interest can't be explained. It just exists. But I've learned to trust this, this instinct of like, just follow what is interesting. And so I realized, like, I have to change the business model to align that with the ability to pursue that which I think is interesting. I'm so grateful to all of the Patreon supporters and I like I cannot express how much of a mental increase in clarity and change this has been for what I was worried about was going to be like a tremendous deal and and actually just brought a lot of really positive support and great messages from people and increased my ability to like work on the things that I think are interesting. And the the way I think about it now is Anybody who's thinking about having a creative career, you are the person who's making things. You're at the center of a series of, of circles and you have some sense about what it is that you want to work on. And hopefully you can find an audience that, that appreciates the stuff that you make. You will have around you a core group of people who are really interested in what it is that you're doing. There's an idea of the thousand true fans. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with that concept? Yeah, that's Kevin Kelly's essay from yeah. probably quite a long time ago now. It would but be yes. a very long time ago now, yeah. Yeah, it, it's this idea that if you make something that 
not just that people like, but that some people really like, you can make a living at it. And it's slightly terrifying to me, but I'm realizing like, okay, I've, I've almost been doing this like a decade now. I'm pretty sure that the gray core audience understands the kinds of things that I make and really likes them. And or shares enough of the taste that you have that even as you move to different things, they have sensibilities close enough to yours that they will adapt happily. Yeah, so a, a creator doesn't stay the same over the time. But they shouldn't. Yeah, and the audience members don't stay the same over the time. Mm -hmm. Like this, I think, is a, a sort of fallacy that you see a lot where people are like, oh, you know, X creator changed. And it's like, well, even if they don't change, you change. You just get older, like you're a different person. Just go back to making gaming videos. <laughs> yeah, it's a good example. But there is a core of like, I've always tried to make these videos that I really like. And I think they have particular characteristics to them, which include things like high rewatchability and, and the way things are explained, like a really intense focus on on the simplicity, like to not explain everything, but to try to figure out like what is the core parts of whatever that is being discussed matter. And over time, you find an audience of people who like the things that you do. And so I just thought like, okay, I'm really going to double down on aligning the incentives between that group and myself. I'm very happy about it because it makes it obvious about how I should focus on, on things. And I always really like aligned incentives in that way. And it's immediately born fruit. So uh, just as like another example, I was working on a video project, which was supposed to be um, the original video for November. And then there was a little, there was a little throwaway part of it, which I thought, oh, that's interesting. Like, let me focus on this for a little bit which ended up being the video about Mercury being the most closest planet. And that is another perfect example of without this focus, I would have regarded the Mercury thing as, oh, that's mildly interesting, but that's not a real video. That's too short and that's too quick to be a real video. And I would never have, have like continued to further investigate it. I would never have reached out to the physicist. I would never have done any of that because my thought would be like, oh, it's it's not going to be enough for an actual video. And I don't think there's anybody in the world who was like, I would prefer it if you hadn't have published that video. Like that's a perfect, short, fun video. And then even within that one, there's the same idea of, oh, this idea is actually quite relatively recent. And it's a really good example of how important it is to be able to ask a correct question. That how you phrase a question is a really important skill that's often overlooked. And now, does that idea make sense to make as a fully animated video? No, not really. But I think it's interesting. And there's an appropriate format, which is the much more casual. I'm going to walk around. I have some bullet points of, of things that I want to talk about and sort of film some stuff and edit it together and just make a little clearly more casual video, but that still expresses this idea. And why? Because I, as the person who owns the channel, am judging that this is interesting. It might not be interesting to everyone in the world, but I think a sizable portion of the gray core audience is interested in this sort of thing. And it is this ability to follow the compass in this way. And it's the same thing again with, you know, I made the video about the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, and that's a sort of classic gray video in the sense that it's talking about voting. But then along with it is the spreadsheet. It's like, oh, I think here's an example where some of the background research is sort of interesting and it didn't really make it into the main video. And I can sort of show a little bit of the process like it doesn't always work out that way that there is something interesting to talk about the process but here is here is a case where it is and like you said before does anyone care whether or not that spreadsheet video is a quote real video no nobody cares <laughs> like this, this this distinction is meaningless to most people and it really just has been a tremendously important turning point i feel like in in my career of aligning incentives thinking about this relationship of people have followed my channel for a long time. They like, they know what to expect and it is totally optional for them to choose to support that. But I think that I can 
I can align my incentives and count on that part of the audience to support the videos. And it's enabled me to focus on the things that I think are interesting for the video production process and simply not have to worry about any other part of it, not have to worry, oh, is this too small to be interesting? I don't have to care about that anymore. Or, you know, on the other side, like with the Indians project, is this project too big and is going to take way too long and can't possibly make any sense to focus on? I don't have to worry about that anymore. I can instead sort of stay focused on this idea. So I wanted to mention all of that because it is such a big deal for me professionally, this concept of clarity. But it is a, it is a thing that I'm continuing to have as the year theme because I'm finding myself applying it to all sorts of areas in my life of, I want things to be obvious in what their purpose is. You know, I, I want the, the decisions to make clear sense. I want to remove ambiguity in situations. Yeah, so we'll talk about it again in a year, but this is where I currently am with my year theme. Can you give me any examples of things that you want to achieve in 2020 that aren't currently going on that align to clarity? Well, here here I have the problem of I don't like to talk about projects that are in development. Mm -hmm. I don't like I don't like to talk about things that are in process until they're done. So there there are things that I'm in particular that I'm thinking about, but I don't want to discuss them now because that's just not the way I work. <laughs> Yeah, I will just reiterate that this is a much less actionable theme than other themes. So it's it's much harder to say something like, oh, I want to be more healthy at the end of the year than I am at the beginning of the year. Like th is, There isn't such directionality, but I can say that for me, this is a fuzzy theme that is also very sharp in my feelings of it and is really focusing my thoughts on a lot of the areas of time and attention of how I'm spending my mental effort. Right. Like, actually, I have a really dumb little one. Uh, anything is good. A tiny area where I've I've noticed that this is, you know, the way that the themes grow and they sort of affect your thinking is I'm increasingly finding myself thinking, am I watching this thing on TV or am I not watching this thing on TV? Right? Like, I, I find myself increasingly annoyed by the habit of, like, having something on that you're sort of half paying attention to. And I feel like watch it or don't like sit down and watch the thing or don't watch the thing, mm -hmm. but don't do this thing where you're sort of half watching it. Like that's a place where I like, I find the clarity like infecting my thoughts. And I think it's, it's in a really good way. Mm, okay. I feel like this is going to be a theme that we will keep touching on throughout the year as yeah. you can say like, okay, so here's this thing that I've done that I can now tell you about, this is what the clarity aspect of it was. Yeah, that's what's going to be the situation. But let's not minimize the thing that you have done, which is the thing that, I mean, you started a while ago, but obviously is like a big part of carrying on into 2020, is the Patreon thing. That is a huge deal. You changed a business mm -hmm. model. It's pretty big. Yeah, it's very terrifying. <laughs> um, I also think that there's a way in which... People can directly see some of that stuff in the videos. So it's just, it's just been interesting. Like I've seen more comments in the past two or three videos where people say like, I just, I really like this one. And people have just left more generic thank you comments of like, Hey, thanks for making your videos. I've been watching them for years and you know, I've, I've really gotten a lot out of them and I really appreciate them. That's part of this feeling that I have of there's a big difference between being a creator who is just starting out and a creator who has what is now a reasonably long term relationship with some portion of the audience who've been following the work for a long time. Mm. Like, I know I feel that way about other creators who I've followed and you just really like, oh, I've been following your work for a really long time. And like you just you have a sort of different relationship if you feel like you're a core member of that audience. So, yeah, this this was me just trying to think about how do I make this better for everyone? A little word of warning for creative professionals, which I think is just a thing to be aware of more so when you're starting out. But you do have to worry a little bit about making things for the audience and, you know, 
when I'm being careful with my words and I'm, I'm thinking about how to express ideas is why I often use phrases like, oh, I make something and I hope the audience likes it. Which is, it's a very different phrase from saying like, I'm making something for the audience. You have to keep this distinction. I think that's much harder to do when you're starting out. But when you're a more established creator, like you, you just have a clearer sense. But it, it can be a danger where a creator can be sort of captured by the audience of like you're continuing to try to make things explicitly for a particular group of people. And that's also part of what I mean by the, the like the clarity of this is I am focusing on what I think is interesting. I've learned over time that my compass is very well tuned in this direction. And there is an audience who appreciates this kind of thing. And I'm making the kind of things that I like to watch. And there's a, like, I found enough of an audience that really enjoys those things. I love stuff that can be watched multiple times and you feel like you get more out of it. So I spend a lot of time engineering the videos to be that way. I like videos that when you watch them, they can bring along like the fun context of that which has come before. And so I also make those kind of videos. I'm in a really interesting place and I feel like I'm very happy and satisfied right now on a personal and professional level. Like I think that the 2019 year theme led perfectly into the 2020 year theme, which helped motivate me to make a, a really important business decision that has affected the work in a really positive way. And I'm incredibly lucky to have an audience that supports me working on the things that, that I think are interesting. And this is a year where I really feel like I'm so happy about the themes and I'm like, I'm so theme positive of like when this works out, it can work out really great as a background process to just to keep in your mind. So now, Mike, what is your theme for 2020? I'm going to do a little story like you. Please do. It's only a short one. A few months ago, I found myself at a dinner. Okay. And it was with some colleagues of mine, but a wider audience of people that I didn't know. Okay. But they were all important people in their own fields. And as I was sitting around this table at a nice restaurant in London, I was realizing some of the conversation going to places that I knew nothing about. So it might be different parts of culture, different conversations around food and wine, right? Like mm -hmm. these individuals were ordering wine for the table. And I had no, I just, no, I, not, I know nothing about wine. And so I started thinking about this. I started thinking about where I am in my life now, personally and professionally, and decided that my yearly theme for 2020 would be the year of refinement. Ooh. So it comes in a bunch of places. One of the key areas is wanting to better myself in ways that are important to me. So one of them is trying to get a more base understanding for food, culture, that kind of stuff. Hmm. Because I find myself more and more in situations where I don't want to be the clueless guy. Mm -hmm. I want to have a base idea for some stuff. So like wine is a very clear example. I have no interest in wine. I don't care about wine. I, I don't really drink alcohol very much at all, honestly. Mm -hmm. It tends to only be when I'm at nice restaurants. But I want to have an idea for what I'm looking for in a way that I now understand coffee a little bit more because that's something that I care about. And so now when I go into a coffee shop, I can look at the coffees they have on the wall, can see the tasting notes, right? So like they taste like this, taste like this. Mm -hmm. And I know which one I'm going to like now because just from a very simple level, I understand that I prefer coffees that have more chocolatey notes than fruity notes. Mm -hmm. It's not very complex. It didn't take me very long to work that out, but it was just something that I focused on, tried some stuff, did some reading, and worked that out. So now, mm -hmm. when given a menu, I have a better understanding of what I want to look at. So when it comes to stuff like wine, I want to understand that a little bit more because I have literally no idea. So <laughs> like, I don't even know 
much of the difference between red wine and white wine. Like, I just, I don't know. Like, people say this is dry and sweet. I don't know what that means. So、mm-hmm. I've just never cared, but I want to learn a little bit. Right. And what I have found, because I assume it's probably pretty similar to coffee, it doesn't take a lot to get a very base level of understanding for what you want to achieve in that area.、Mm-hmm. This is also extending itself into other areas of my life. A big one of them is something that I can now. So I mentioned like something that I'm able to focus on more now is fashion.、It、used to be a very big thing in my life. I really cared about the clothes that I wore and wanted to look good because it made me feel good. But I wasn't able to feel good for a long time because I wasn't confident. Now I have my self confidence back. I'm focusing on what I wear more and it's making、mm. me happy. Because it was something I cared about. I don't think it's something everyone should care about. I don't think it's something everybody needs to care about. But it was a part of my life for a long time. But I lost it. But now I found it again and it's making me happy. And then there's the other part of it of being more open. To different types of experiences, being a little more adventurous, taking、mm-hmm. more risks, doing things that I might not have done in the past.、Mm-hmm. I feel like I am at a point in my life now where I want to be a little bit more open to those things before anything else in my life happens that might shut me off from them. And so I'm taking this opportunity now, when the, the year of refinement, to allow myself to. Try some stuff out. So that's where I am for personally, but there's a, there's、hmm. a lot more here. Oh, I, one other thing that goes into the personal area actually hobbies. So I spoke about this on the show recently because it's been going on in my mind for a while. I want to have interests that are just my interests that work isn't attached to. And I'm still working on that. I'm not sure yet of other things. Like I mentioned phot- photography as well. Like that is something that I've really enjoyed. Like、mm-hmm. taking photos on my smartphone, understanding how to edit them in a way that I like, working on that. Like, that is a fun little hobby, but I still want to be able to have more. I want to have interests that are my interests that I don't also make into jobbies. <laughs> I just want some hobbies. <laughs> And that comes in refining who I am as a person more、mm-hmm. into. Making myself a more well rounded individual.、Mm-hmm. That's what I want to be. And I feel like that layers into refinement. But there's also professional aspects to this as well as personal. So, again, I want to, this is borrowing a little bit from the year of less, but not fully. I want to take the focus off of some areas in my life. To be able to put more focus onto newer projects again. So, Cortex Brand is one of them.、Mm. And I have another project that I'm working on right now that I'm very excited about. And I want to make sure that I'm able to refine other things in my life to allow me to focus on that. But both of these projects, Cortex Brand and New Project, which Should be something people know about within the next couple of months. They are also in service of refining who I am and how I am seen professionally.、Hmm. So, how I am seen to the world, I want to refine. Like, one of those is, right? Like, one of the guys in charge of a company that makes these products, like the theme system.、Mm-hmm. Well, I want that to become part of who I am.、Mm-hmm. And then this other podcast related project that I'm working on is in a slightly different area than what I currently cover, which I want to change people's perception a little bit about the type of person that I am with this project. So that is the year of refinement. That's interesting on multiple levels. I really, I really like that one. I will say I'm, 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 I'm a little self conscious of this one in a few reasons. Okay. But, like, you know, I, I want to share it with the Cortexans, right? Because, like, there is this idea of, like, ugh, food and wine. Yeah, there, yeah there's an idea、you know? of what a refined individual is, which is sort of a douchebag. Like, yeah, that's it's... right. And that's what I, I really want to try and av- avoid that. And I, but I don't know if I can. But there is just this situation.、I've, I just keep finding myself in these places where. I feel like I need to be quiet 
because I'm、mm-hmm. worried about the things I don't know about. Right. And I don't want to keep finding myself in those situations because I, and I genuinely have an interest in wanting to learn a little bit more about this stuff.、Mm-hmm. And like, it's like with coffee, I don't spend hundreds of pounds on coffee. Yeah. In the same way that I don't want to spend hundreds of pounds on wine, but I want to have an idea of this stuff. I want to、mm-hmm. know about it. I want to know how to choose something because right now I don't know how to choose any of these things. So it's just something that I want to be able to focus a little bit more closely on for when I find myself in a situation where I need to know something. I can understand the concerns about the word, and I can understand why you feel a little bit self conscious about it. Because there is a way in, in which an uncharitable listener would say something like, Ooh, Mike wants to be a fancy man. Look how fancy that well, Mike is. Well, Mike's always wanted to be a fancy man. I mean, there's no, there's no, <laughs> well, there's no denying you know, that part, I suppose. Yes. But the next part of that sentence was, was going to be, and you already lean into that a little bit, right? So,、mm-hmm. like, I, under, I understand the sensitivity over this. But, but this also is where, Language is but a limited tool to communicate ideas. And an important part of, of thinking about the themes is like, what does the word mean to you? The word I always use for this is resonate. Like, what word resonates with you? It doesn't really matter what the dictionary definition is, but like, what word triggers something in your mind that provokes a positive reaction? Yeah, because I had all of these thoughts and they all landed on the one word. I was able to、yeah. bring everything together. Right,、mm-hmm. of like taking some more focus off, putting it into other places, wanting to learn some more things about the world and who I am as a person. I was like, oh, all of these are like ideas of refining. Yeah, I like the refining because it does hit on specific things. of, you know, There are some situations where you, you might feel like you want to know something. And it also, like you said, professionally, Has that other meaning of not a huge change, but a slight adjustment of like, here's some areas where there are adjustments that you want to be made. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a really interesting one. It's, it, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny because you mentioned the thing with the hobbies, because you mentioned other things with my own year theme. Like, oh, what other examples can you think of? And one of the things with Year of Clarity for me is recognizing that everything is work. There's almost nothing that I do in terms of media consumption or reading books or taking walks or how I spend my t- Like almost all of it is work with very narrow exceptions and just totally giving up the idea that I will ever have any kind of hobby. It's like, no, this is all just, this is all just work. You're always working in, in some way. And that's totally fine when you think about work in this way. So it's like, I, that doesn't work for everyone. It has worked for me. For a long time. Yeah. But now I just want to have a few other things. Yeah. Like you want to carve out a space in your life that is separate from all of this.、Mm-hmm. And I will be extraordinarily curious to know how that goes. Because so much of your work is talking about things in your life, I do think you are in a particularly difficult situation in, in the same way that I am. of... Of not having that creep expand, in the very least, of when you take up painting, that it doesn't come into the shows in some way. It's almost impossible for it not to. There is a line that I have drawn. Okay. I do not mind these things coming up, but the idea of creating properties around them is the line. So、mm, okay. I have no problem talking about the fact that I am taking photos on my iPhone. Editing them、right. in Fisco and uploading them to Instagram. I have no problem doing an episode of a show talking about that.、Right. I do not want to create a mobile photography podcast. Okay. All right. This is the distinction. I have no problem in talking about the fact that I like watches and wearing real watches more than my Apple Watch, and that I have an interest in that. And I like browsing Instagram and looking at pictures of watches and planning、mm-hmm. out like purchases that I might make in a few years' time. But I'm not starting a watch podcast.、Mm, right? Okay. Okay. That's the line that I'm drawing. And so that, that's kind of where I am with it. But I want to have some more active things than those. Because,、mm-hmm. like, the photography just happens when it happens. Watches is just whenever I browse Instagram. <laughs> but, like,、mm-hmm. it's not like carving out time to do a thing. 
I have an idea of a thing, but I'm gonna keep it to myself for now. I probably will cut that out actually. No, no, leave it, leave it in because you, you like, you have to be mysterious too sometimes. Do I always I? feel bad about making All making right. references to future projects, and like, I know that can be frustrating sometimes. But I, like, I have to draw those lines of what am I willing to talk about when? Okay, I'll, I'll throw you a bone on that one. Yeah, then. you have to, you have to leave that in okay. just just to help me out, so I'm not always the mysterious guy. Okay, you can be mysterious guy, and I'll be fancy boy, and then that's how we're known. <laughs> I'm curious, do you have any specific ideas about how to pursue a sort of general increase in, in knowledge, like with the wine or with other things where you, you feel like you want to know more about a topic? Classes. Hmm, okay. So in mentioning this to my wife, like Adina has mentioned that like she's found a thing and she wants to buy it for me for a present. She told me about this one because it requires scheduling, but she just found like introduction to wine class. So you just go, and it's like a tasting, but they also teach you what you're learning about. Hmm. It's like, that's just like, and then I can get the base level that I need and can go from there. And I hmm. think that that will, that will give me the confidence to at least say something. Because that's all it is, really. You know, when somebody says to me, you want to get wine? And I'm like, okay. And then they instinctively know, based on the food that I'm eating, what color wine hmm. to get. And I'm like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I want to know that, right? Or I want to know, like, do you want, as I mentioned before, like, sweet or dry? Mm-hmm. Uh, sweet sounds nice, I guess. Like, I don't know. And I just want to be able to have an idea of answering those questions. And that's that's kind of the route that I want to, f- to follow, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, or I, I don't know if this, is, if this is on your mind, but there's a way to just, I, I think of this sometimes as it doesn't take a lot of knowledge to be, able to ask a knowledgeable question in a situation exactly exactly like because again so going back to coffee right once i learned what i needed i can say ask someone if they don't have it written down like what are the tasting notes i hate that phrase but i don't know what else to say (laughs) of this coffee Mm -hmm. and this one and they'll tell me and be like i want that one then right or i can say like oh i tend to prefer chocolatey flavors like what would you recommend Mm-hmm. When before, I'd be like, I wouldn't know what to say. Like, I would have no idea what to say. Just be like, I'll have that one, I guess. Mm-hmm. But you just learn. You said the base piece of information to be able to ask an intelligent or informed question. Mm. So that's where I want to get to. And I've gotten there with a lot of food stuff as well over the last few years. Yeah, I feel like over the past couple of years, they've been the, the years of palate expansion for Mike, mm-hmm. for sure. Definitely. I've noticed that big change in you. And so, like, you know, if I will pull back the curtain this a little bit, in the hopes that it minimizes the the taunting, I have had a very complicated relationship with food growing up. And, mm-hmm. like, for health issues and stuff like that, I had to have a very focused and strict diet and couldn't vary from it very much. And as I've grown up, I've found ways to manage that, and plus the effects have changed, luckily. So it has allowed me to be more confident with trying food because at a certain point, it became like a mental block more than a, a physical block, like a health-related block. Right. Like it was, it was mental because I've been taught the things that I could and couldn't eat. So the idea of trying this or trying that, having any spice, for example, in my food, is like you just can't do that. But mm-hmm. now I can. Now I can eat Indian food, which is like up until – Last year, I had never eaten Indian food because I couldn't, Mm. but now I can, right? So, like, being able to explore just what I can eat more has been, like, a big thing for me over the last few years, and now I'm, like, I want to get over the finish line with it, and, like, Mm. this is, like, one of the last things that I have to do, and when I talk about being adventurous, that is also with food. We've been talking Mm. about sushi a lot on this show recently, (laughs) right? And, like... So now, like, the final part is, like, fish sushi. Yes. Sushi, the scariest of foods. Yeah. It really is for someone (laughs) like me. It's it's the most beautiful and also the most intimidating. Right? It's like, you don't really like fish, do you? No. Well, how about a bunch of raw ones? I was like, I don't, I can't. No. (laughs) How about the pure essence of fish? Would you enjoy that? (laughs) So these are the ideas of the the refining of myself. It's like it is Mm. taking away the last areas of this and so then i can walk into any restaurant and be comfortable 
And being able to do that is something I never thought I would be able to do. Like having days of anxiety and nerves about going to a restaurant picked by a friend because I wasn't sure about the menu. Like this is a this was a thing that I lived in for a long time, like until very recently. And now I'm like starting to get to a point where my understanding of food is allowing me to be much more confident that I can go to any restaurant and find something mm. on a menu. And like coming to get to that point has made such a massive impact on my life as it, when it comes to traveling as well. So I was mm. hesitant to travel to certain places because if I couldn't, if like for example, if they couldn't put the menu in English, like I was worried that like, what am I going to order? Mm. And so being able to get to that point has really helped me. So I want to be able to take those last few areas away. And it's like being adventurous and being able to order. And that, so that's what I want to get to this year because I've gotten real close now and I just want to finish that off. I really like that theme. I, I really like that one a lot for two reasons. It's, it's a good example of a different sort of theme than people might normally think of. And I, I like that it's, it's specific. Like it's, it's, you know, you're, you're trying to achieve some things again, there, there isn't a fail state, but it's just more comfortable, more knowledgeable in different situations. I really like that one. That's a, that's a very interesting one for the year. Yeah. So I got a lot of personal this year, but there is some professional and I will, mm -hmm. after the project launches that I'm working on, I will be able to talk more about how it relates back to this theme. Mm -hmm. I mentioned I have one other little thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. There's two. There's two things. It's not. This is not a theme for me. Oh, okay. Mega Office 3.0. Oh, okay. <laughs> the theme is everything has its place. Ah, uh, all right. This office is out of control, <laughs> and it needs to be organized. And the the goal of the office organization, which will happen at some point this year is everything has a place and it must have a place. And if it doesn't have a place, you need to create one. That's good. That's good. I like that. Yeah. And, and I, I, I won't tease you at all. I agree. That's not really a theme, but that's much more of a like, I need to get this done this year. Yeah, <laughs> but I figured the only way I can do it is by giving it a cool phrase. And the phrase is right. everything has its place. That's the theme of the office. Hey, hey, look, I'm a fan of project names. You know me. Like Giving the things you want to do fun names that is that is part of the way of tricking your brain you know i'm not cleaning my office this is mega office 3.0 right you gotta fool yourself in that way it's good i like that <laughs> okay cortexans you know what's coming now we have been talking for many hours about our themes where do you put those themes where'd you put them gray where are you going to keep track of this sort of thing? Where are you going to every single day relate back to your theme where you take that time in your day to sit down, reflect on your theme? Is there something that people who have been professionally thinking about themes for years have made for you? Well, guess what? There is. There is. The Theme System Journal. The Theme System Journal. There it is. So <laughs> when you are listening to this show... If you are listening to it on the perfect day, which is December 31st, the theme system journal is back in stock at cortexmerch.com. Cortexmerch.com. We ordered more than last time. Right. I still don't know how long they're going to stick around for. We're back to the exact same point again that we were last time. They're either going to be in stock for two days or two months. Nobody knows. Yeah. If this happens to be your first episode of Cortex, the the creation of this journal has been a very long saga uh, that Mike and I have, have spent trying to get this thing made as a place for if you want to have a way to track your themes and to daily remind yourself what it is that you're trying to do like we've been trying to make this journal for a long time and there have been highs and there have been lows and one of the things that we've been unable to figure out is order sizes like how many to buy for how many we can sell without also risking going bankrupt mm -hmm. this has been an epic journey that the past us would have thought by this point in time would be long settled 
and stable, but it is it is still not. It is far from. <laughs> it is very far from settled at this point. And if this is new to you, we have a website. It's thethemesystem.com that explains the journal. It's split into three sections. You have the section where you write down your yearly themes and you outline what you would like to achieve from them. Then you have daily journaling pages where you can create your own things that you want to be thinking about every day and you can sit and write them out. And then you have your daily themes where I do this, many people do this. It's like a kind of like a habit tracking thing. Here are a bunch of ideas, a bunch of questions, a bunch of elements that I want to make sure that every single day I am moving ahead a little bit. Mm. In the coming weeks, I want to think about, and I haven't been able to really wrap my head around this, but what are going to be my daily themes for 2020? Will the year of refinement refine them? Probably, but mm-hmm. I don't know yet. So I'm going to be thinking about that in future episodes. But if you want some detail, you want to see some images and want to look, see what it looks like, go to thethemesystem.com and there's a bunch of information there. Then if you want to buy them, there are links there, but you can go to cortexmerch.com and you can buy them. Here's yes. the thing. If these sell out, we still don't know when they'll be back in stock again, but we're working on it. Yeah, so... If you are listening to this in the far future, at that point, we will, we will hopefully have stabilized the business and we will have a journal that you can buy yep. at any time. However, if you are listening to this episode close to the point of publication, it is extraordinarily likely that we might sell out of these yet again mm-hmm. and be right back to where we started and just have to order more. So if you know for sure that you want one and you're listening near the date of publication, you should not be waiting. Yeah, I would be quick about it. Right. That's that's my suggestion. We're trying to make this more regular. That is the ultimate goal. We don't want to have these moments of, oh, there's some journals run, (laughs) you know, grab them quick. Like that's not that's not the ideal situation. But it's it's fair warning to say that at time of publication, that may still be the situation. Fun thing. I am about to finish my first theme journal. I have a couple more weeks left because because of the way we've designed our journal, Mm -hmm. you can work in it as much as you want. We decided we were not going to pre-print dates because people work differently. I only use the theme system journal on days where I am working. So the weekends, Mm -hmm. I do not do it. If I'm traveling, I do not do it. So I started mine when we got the first stock in in June. So I go Mm -hmm. through one about every six months is what I've learned. And I'm just about to finish my first one. Fun fact, I have a hundred sitting here. This is a story for another time, but which we will get to. Uh, so I have my pick of journals to go through. Right, yeah. Mike personally doesn't have a, a shortage of, of journals to pick. but <laughs> Mike has the opposite. He has too many. But again, that is a story for another time. Yeah, cortexmerch.com. Go check out the theme journal. If you have come up with a yearly theme and want to share it with us, or if you have been working on a yearly theme for the last year and want to tell us how you've been doing, we want to know about that. So you can tweet at the show, at Cortex Podcast. Mm -hmm. Use the hashtag, Ask Cortex. It's just a great way to collect them up, so I'll definitely see them. Or comment in the Reddit thread, um, Mm -hmm. either on the Cortex subreddit or in the entry for this episode on Gray subreddit. I want to know. That was a wonderful thing last year people were sharing. I want to know what you've been working on and what you're working towards. Yeah, I, I really enjoy seeing the different themes that people have and their explanations and, and what it means to them. Like I, I, I really, really enjoy that in the in the subreddit. So yeah, I would I would say if, if there's if there's something that you want to work on, I think that's a good place to just leave a comment. I think it's it's also nice to just have a little record of it. Mm-hmm. And I would be doubly curious for anybody who has commented last year if if they want to have a follow-up about mm. how that has worked out for them i'd i'd like to see that like i i just find it very interesting to see the the different ways that people interpret this semi free form way of trying to make your life better in various ways so yeah I'd, I'd love to see the themes for this year and i'd really love to see follow-up from previous year if if that's something that you as a listener wish to share so happy new year, everybody. Happy new theme. Yes. If you're doing that. Happy new year, Cortexans. Happy new theme.